Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Friday Morning at the Fun House. As always, in the co-captain's chair, all the way from Toronto, Canada, Mr. Martin Popoff. Good morning, Martin. Yes. How you doing, sir? This is um, great seeing you back. Yes. Good to be back. Good to be back. It's been a busy week and back in the saddle. Uh, October is finishing up and sun is shining. Most of the leaves are on the ground. I had to take out the mower yesterday and chop them all up because uh, we could barely see the grass anymore. When you have three dogs, you got to be able to find certain things out in that lawn. So with all the leaves, it's kind of wow, hard yeah, to do good that. Point, so. good point, yeah. <laughs> Freezing cold in Toronto, that's for sure. It's definitely, uh, you know, late fall is here now. So <laughs> yeah, none of this kind of 65, 70 degree weather. Yeah, I think today I got up this morning, it was like 48 degrees or something like that, or if that. So uh, yeah, it was definitely a little chilly. And last night was was breezy and chilly too. So I think the frost is coming sooner rather than later. And to celebrate uh, November coming up, uh, we've got a brand new kind of little mini series for you here today on the channel. This is a cool new concept that Martin and I have crafted up. Uh, you know, we often talk about top 10 songs and these songs that we love and all this kind of stuff. Well, you know what? Most of the classic bands that we all have come to love and appreciate over the years, you know, they've got some songs that, uh, you know, every, every band's got songs that aren't that good. That songs that have been ridiculed by fans and journalists like us and, you know, songs that just kind of suck, right? So what we've done is Martin and I have each picked five bands we really like a lot. And we've gone and put together a list of those five most ridiculed songs. And let's let's kind of talk about this ridicule thing. So these are songs that, you know, many fans complain about that they don't really like or journalists and reviewers have said they don't like or they maybe there's some real history about how bad these songs are. Or maybe it's just personally songs that Martin and I just don't like from these bands. So I don't know, Martin, if you want to expand on that a little bit. And that this, this yeah. was an interesting and fun thing to do i think yeah it's a good point this idea of ridicule it's almost like um you know it, it can't be just us uh, it has to be sort of there is a narrative of ridicule out there and you know your buddies have ridiculed these songs as well and maybe and maybe you've seen reviews where that song was picked out as as a ridiculed song so it's it's not just it's not just straightforward crappy songs or songs we personally don't like it's ones we're pretty sure that have been somewhat ridiculed out there and and we've been uh you know guilty parties in participating in that and and it's funny going through a lot of this um, there, there's, there's some neat contours here about bands that were at a certain point too cute, too cool to have any of their songs ridiculed. And then at another point, they were so bad that you felt sorry for them that all the songs weren't that great. You go, oh dear, they can't write songs anymore. And it almost felt, it almost felt mean ridiculing them. So, it, so there's, so I've noticed there's sort of like a, uh, like a sweet spot in here where, where it's like, you know, the band should be able to do better and you know they can take the criticism and darn it we're going to give them the criticism because they're big boys at this point and and they could be criticized so it's so it's not so much when they first start out and 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 we think you know that they're, they're just they're just young kids and they don't know any better and it's certainly not when we think they really they really like this i i kind of feel bad for them because everything deserves ridicule so it's so it's funny where these songs show up in the catalog yeah exactly and, and all that being said we fully understand that there's going to be folks watching who like a lot of these songs and that's okay because not everybody has to agree on songs and albums what some of the things that we love you guys may hate with things we don't like and other people don't like you may love so if any of these are cherished songs for you that's okay in fact that's good right but the general consensus seems to be that these are kind of stinkers in the catalogs of these bands so with that i'll have martin kick us off with his first band and his first five songs yeah, exactly. And, and just to build on that point, this is a combination of opinion and reporting. We're actually kind of giving you history at the same time, plus kind of agreeing and throwing in our opinion. So my first band is Iron Maiden. Um, so Iron Maiden first were ridiculed. I totally remember this distinctly. Uh, they were not ridiculed for anything before this moment. The moment is Quest for Fire on Peace of Mind. That was the first time everybody had a consensus going oh dear you know this is this is a little embarrassing this song you know when when uh dinosaurs walk the earth and all that right it's like that's the first time all of us maiden fans who lo loved everything maiden had done up to that point looked at each other and kind of snickered a little right it was a it was the first time you got one of these 
these are the people in your neighborhood's uh, Sesame Street sort of uh, lyrics about, you know, various occupations or, or things out there in, in the world that seemed like a little bit too topical. And, and I kind of went back and thought, you know, there are songs that that people think are a little substandard on previous albums, but none of them really stood out for ridicule. So Quest for Fire is one. Another one that is very, very similar is when you get to Somewhere in Time, The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner. We all ridiculed that at the time, too. It was just another. And Rush has one. Is it is it Marathon that's also about this? I, I don't know. I, I think it is. But but the point is, it's like here they are writing a song about long distance running. We all ridiculed that one. Another one, very similar, absolutely ridiculed at the time when you get to No Prayer for the Dying, Mother Russia. That one, everybody just, just thought that song was the biggest stinker. It's got the, the Russian melodies put in, you know, it's like, like when Accept breaks into their Russian choruses sort of thing, right? Um, absolutely ridiculed song there. Um, moving forward in time, I picked The Angel and the Gambler. Everybody, uh, I've got a, I've got a few props here. I'm, I'm forgetting to show my props, but we've got, uh, we've got, you know, Iron Maiden, Virtual Eleven here, right? And, uh, and uh, Angel and the Gambler, second song on the album, it's ridiculed. I remember my good buddy Jimmy K when we did my old Iron, Iron Maiden um, album by album book. I think he pointed this out that the chorus in that, the uh, "Don't you think I'm a savior? Don't you think I can save you? Don't you think I can save your life?" happens at least 22 times in this song, right? <laughs> and everybody thinks that's a low point of a very low period for Iron Maiden. They just look at that. Everybody points out that song and complains about it. And I wanted to go with one modern era one, Writing on the Wall. The, the first single from Senjutsu was somewhat ridiculed for being a little bit too rock and rollsy. You know, I remember, you know, people were saying, and I was saying, it sounds like Southern rock. It sounds like Bon Jovi, all these sorts of things, right? So, so the, the first single and Maiden, everybody complains about Maiden, you know, that, uh, you know, that as well, right? I mean, oh, yeah. the, the, the controversy, right? Um, but definitely that was, that was a, a ridiculed song uh, by Maiden. I had, I, I had a few other, just um, throw them out as honorable mentions, Wasting Love, when they did a, a, a power ballad, they tried that for the first time. Uh, they got ridiculed for that. Heaven Can Wait with that ridiculous chorus. Uh, Alexander the Great just felt like, rhyme of the ancient mariner part two and we all kind of rolled our eyes at that um and virus actually virus is uh is a song that they they pushed as a single and a lot of people uh, it's it's not so much a ridiculed one it's one that people say that was not a very good song to, to put forward as a single people say it's one of the worst uh things they ever did as a single so there you go iron maiden oh one more um they got a little bit of ridicule for tears Tears of a Clown, which was written about Robin Williams. I mean, it took it took some some courage to do that, yeah. but a lot of people said, you know what, that's a, that's either a little in bad taste or it's a little searching for something. It just doesn't seem like something you should write a Maiden song about. Uh, it, it's something about it bothered people, and it, it got a little bit of ridicule for that. So so there's my there's a lot of Maiden there. So there's my yeah. Maiden. you know in hindsight though, so a lot of those songs have held up pretty well, I think. But yeah, I definitely remember many of those were kind of like picked on quite a bit. So yeah. it happens. All right. My first choice of the day is going to be Led Zeppelin. And uh, for those of you out there is like, oh, no, Led Zeppelin never made a bad song. Well, you know, that's debatable, I guess. But they do have some songs that have been kind of targeted over the years. Number one on the list is this song from Houses of the Holy called Dear Maker or Dire Maker or Did You Maker or Jim Maker, however the hell it's supposed to be said. Or just straight Jamaica. It's or just straight Jamaica, right? Yeah, whatever. I, I, I've been told numerous Fort times Jamaica. throughout the years that no, you say it this way. No, you say it that way. Whatever. I mean, come on. Do we want to hear Led Zeppelin doing this reggae pop, whatever the hell you want to call it? No. Uh, I think, you know, the House of the Holy album is really interesting because you have a lot of different flavors on that album. And but it's like, is that like Led Zeppelin? Does anybody want to hear? It, it's kind of a cute song, but people have made fun of this forever. And on the same album, we got two of them on this album, unfortunately. Uh, how about Led Zeppelin doing James Brown style funk, the crunge, right? I mean, just it's just ridiculous. I love that album and I can listen to both those songs. And I'm like, I, I kind of appreciate them for the weirdness of hearing Zeppelin do that sort of thing. But I mean, people have poked fun of both of those songs forever, forever. 
Uh, what else we got? There's a couple other oddities here that, that people have targeted. Uh, Led Zeppelin doing a pop love song, All of My Love in Through the Outdoor. I mean, I, I remember how horrified my friends and I were when that album came out. And that was the first big single. Uh, uh, single and we're like, what is this? Right. Do we really do we really want to hear the mighty Led Zeppelin crooning about all of my love? Debatable. Right. What else? Uh, we know that uh, the guys in the band, specifically Robert, were a big fan of like, uh, you know, 50 style Elvis rock and roll or what have you. But Hot Dog, Barroom 50s Boogie. I don't know. Candy Store Rock from Presence. Yeah. Again, do we want to hear Led Zeppelin trying to do the Elvis thing? No. We want to hear Led Zeppelin doing big, bombastic, heavy blues rock, right? That's what they do best. They're doing that kind of mystical, you know, folky type of thing. But Zeppelin doing reggae, pop, straight love songs, James Brown style funk, Elvis style rock and 50s boogie, no thanks. So, you know, it, it was kind of hard to, to find anything else other than those songs. There are songs that I personally don't like but pe most people love. So I didn't want to pick on things like rock and roll or, you know, I mean, Stay Away to Heaven has got plenty of shit over people for, for throughout the years for being overplayed, but it's still a legendary song. But these five, yeah, these have been targeted quite a bit over the years. So uh, those, those are my choices for Zeppelin. Wow, that, that was amazing. You like read my mind exactly. I'm thinking, <laughs> what is Pete going to pick on this? Literally, I think Led Zeppelin, so, so this makes a good point. Like those are the five and there are no more. That's absolutely the truth. So, so a lot of these bands, I mean, this is a clear cut example of Led Zeppelin doesn't have a lot of songs that have been in for ridicule. A lot of bands just don't have a lot of songs they've been ridiculed for and zeppelin yeah. is one of them they yeah. have these five and it's absolutely true and then the and then the gate shuts right yeah the, the, these the stick out like on... a sore thumb they stick out like a sore yeah, thumb yeah yeah and you know give them credit for doing something different i guess but i you set yourself up for a little bit of ridicule by doing stuff this yeah. far off the beaten path for a band like led zeppelin yeah yeah all right uh so my next band is uh judas priest i'm gonna start with a little bit of a contentious one um, I don't believe this one that much. It's more of a personal choice, but off of my favorite Judas Priest album, Hellbent for Leather or Killing Machine, Evening Star to me almost feels like the advanced, advanced single from British Steel. Um, that was the song that us as kids definitely ridiculed. We thought this is a little simple and poppy and we really don't like that chorus. Evening Star, you know? Uh, and, and that simple that simple chord pattern, it just stuck out like a sore thumb on this album, which is so full of charm and heaviness and darkness and slow songs and fast songs. This, this is one of my top, you know, five or six favorite albums of all time. I mean, I just, I just love it to death. Absolutely. My favorite priest album. Um, so that one um, moving on, I would say you say yes is the one that is pulled out of point of entry as the, as the lightning rod uh, along with turning circles, I suppose, as the ones when people say, Oh dear, this was not a very good album. I mean, and they, that's the song they usually point to, you know, you say, yes, I say, you know, that, that little poppy sing songy, uh, you know, um, schoolyard sort of chorus on it. Um, and then moving forward, parental guidance on turbo uh absolutely and and i have honorable mentions on there the scorpion songs on there called rock you all around the world and wild nights the hot crazy days i mean literally those sound like i, I thought they were scorpion songs in in a way right but par parental guidance really gets pointed out with that really super saccharine verse melody uh the way it all works and and the and the lyrics which sound like you know they're supposed to be coming out of a 12 year old right um so that one was hugely ridiculed. Uh, Johnny Be Good. When you get there, to you go. I was waiting for that one. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Ha have to include that um, because it's it's like it's on this this failure of a movie, and it's uh, it it doesn't fit the album. And then, by the way, they kind of rewrite the music into a heavy metal song, so it doesn't sound like the regular Johnny Be Good. And it's just it's just bad, uh, and it definitely was in for a ton of ridicule on that. And then Loch Ness. Loch Ness is like the uh, you know the the massive aquatic man uh, you know uh reptile of uh of judas priest ridiculed songs uh you know people just thought this is this is a bridge too far 
on uh, on Angel of Retribution. It's super long, and it's got it also has a terrible chorus that old Loch Ness, Loch Ness. You know, just like so bad. And and so there you go. I mean that that is that is essentially my whole list. Um, I can't think of too many other truly ridiculed songs uh, in the Priest catalog. People people generally really like it, but these these you know most of these stand out like a sore thumb. As well. I, got, I got one for you. <clears throat> How about all of Nostradamus? Yeah, exactly. I, I looked at Nostradamus. And Sorry, thinking, Nostradamus fans. <laughs> yeah. So, so the point there is that, you know, you get to this idea is that the whole album is so ridiculed that you can't even pick out uh, one right. song for ridicule. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm so happy you picked Johnny Be Good because my next band, they have a real stinker cover as well. And uh, among some other stuff. So let's talk about Whitesnake. All right. Everybody knows I love White Snake. They're one of my favorite bands of all time. But they got some, they got some, they got some stuff in their catalog that been kind of, uh, you know, thrown some tomatoes at. Uh, number one on my list is uh, from their Trouble album. Sorry, folks, but nobody should be doing covers of the Beatles. Least of all, David Coverdale and company. Day Tripper. Not good. Not good. And they not only covered the Beatles once, they did it twice. All right. Way more than they should have. So no good. Uh, but again, you know, early album trying to get their feet wet. You know what? Throw in a cover of a very famous song. It doesn't work, though. The rest of the album is really good. Uh, here, let's go to their most recent album, Flesh and Blood. The first song, and, and this could be a mini rant right now. The first song that they released from that album as a single is the worst song on the album. Mm -hmm. Shut up and kiss me. It's like, you know, Whitesnake has been trying for so many years to get away with, get away from this whole, we were a hair metal band tag from the 80s, right? And what do they do? They put a, a song on their most recent album, which is very good, by the way. Uh, and they released the first song as a single, single, which is totally of that era and totally fits that mold. I mean, Shut Up and Kiss Me is silly. It's juvenile. And it's not what the essence of White Snake is all about. And I remember when that song got released, people were like, what the hell is this? If this is how the rest of the album is going to be, I'm not bothering with it. Thankfully, the rest of the album is not like that. But it's just this just nonsensical, silly, hair metal -y, you know. And again, I'm almost using it in a bad way now. Because normally, when we talk about hair metal stuff, we mean, you know, most of the bands we talk about, we... we we're very positive on it. It's just that it's a term that someone created, whatever, but everybody knows what it is. But a song like Shut Up and Kiss Me is derogatory just by nature. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the rest of the album is much better. But why they, I, I just don't understand, and I see it a lot, why these bands or record labels release these first songs as singles of upcoming albums, and they don't even give you anything near being the best song on the album. I, I don't understand. I've seen this over and over and over again. Anyway. That's a story for another day. Uh, on the same token, let's go back to Slip of the Tongue. In fact, I got two from Slip of the Tongue. Kitten's Got Claws. Silly, silly song. It could be the, uh, the stepmother to Shut Up and Kiss Me. Just ridiculous. And again, you know, Coverdale, I guess, at times has this whole thing about kittens and all that, whatever. It's just silly 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 again succumbing to everything that they were saying they were not all about you know white snake were always like well we're just you know we're a bluesy heavy rock band in the midst of all this hair metal craziness we're not like that and then you put out a song like that no good uh i'm gonna get back to slip of the tongue in a minute but let's go to the 87 album is this love which a i know the women love it ranked high on the charts they have to play it live every time sold a bazillion copies whatever hit humongous song but all of the guys hate that song we all hate it we all hate is this love uh the wives and the girlfriends love it we don't like it sappy ballad whatever I, I would personally wish the song would go away but let's release the next album and let's do is this love part two with deeper the love more lame ballads because you know the record labels gotta says we gotta move units we gotta get videos out there with david and tawny we gotta you know all that kind of stuff and for all of you know the more hard rock fans of white snake who want the heavier stuff big disappointments there and again it just it just showed deeper the love that let's just pander to that that hit audience right let's pander to the ladies and put out something that will sell. So those are my songs for White Snake. I could have thrown a couple others out there, but I think everybody gets the pictures. With Night Snake, no covers, 
stay away from the damn ballads and stay away from the really silly spandexy type of stuff because that's not what white snake is all about there we go yeah that's an awesome list i would only add one that i can think of off the top of my head and that would be the remake of fool for your loving which you i almost went there yeah i almost yeah you know it just sounds uh you know uh coagulated and and overworked uh and the the original is perfectly fine and here they are just kind of like trying to do the same thing they did with here i go again and crying yeah. in the rain uh so so that that definitely was in for some ridicule people thought it was kind of a jump in the shark moment you're just kind of doing the same thing again you're just trying to trying to you know but even so i mean they took the essence away from the original version i mean the yeah the, the that remake of that song was all about flash and showing the great things that Steve Vai can do. And it took away the essence of that track. Whereas I personally think the, the remake they did of Crying in the Rain was way better. Yeah. Um, it just became yeah. this monster of a song. And, you know, Here I Go Again was a good track originally, and it became a real anthem uh, with the remake. Uh, Fool for Your Lovin', I don't think worked out quite as well. I think they wanted it to, obviously. They wanted to hit a home run again, lightning in a bottle, but it didn't, didn't work out that way. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, I got one more just to kind of grab one more. I uh, don't oh, know. That's uh, not, not the close, close by Blue Oyster Cult for this. So my next band is Blue Oyster Cult. I thought I had another prop. I'm keeping it. I forget uh, showing my prop. So I'll I'll do what I have here for Blue Oyster Cult. Um, Debbie, uh, Debbie Denise, uh, I remember being the first song by Blue Oyster Cult, really, that was ever ridiculed uh, because Agents of Fortune came out and, uh, you know, it, it had it had things that sounded a little heavier than the past the the old you know the, the black and white period and then it had things that were much popular and debbie denise really shocked a lot of people and it was in for a lot of red ridicule i mean even the title debbie denise and it's it's sung by uh, albert i believe right um and it's just poppy and not well put together and that album is not very well recorded so that was definitely in for some ridicule um then you get you know get you get to mirrors and uh, you're not the one I was looking for. Albert's uh, joke song, uh, you know, written to sound like the cars. And then he was horrified that it actually got added to the album. That whole thing's in my Blue Oyster Cult book, uh, Agents of Fortune, I think I called it, the Blue Oyster Cult story. So, so this album, number one, uh, it's a little bit like what we were saying about You Say Yes on Point of Entry. And, and the album cover reminds me of Point of Entry. Yeah, it does. Um, but you're not the one I was looking for is the song that people use to push the narrative that, that this is a poppy blue oyster cult album. When in reality, it's not much poppier than agents or specters really. Um, it's, it's about the same level of heaviness, but you're not the one I was looking for is the one that is always pointed out as the one that is, is just like, okay, they went too far on, on this record. Um, my, my third choice for blue oyster cult would be a let go. Um, Let's see. Yeah. Okay. So revolution by night. Um, you know, this has some things that are, that are a little poppy and it's got the, it's got the electronic drums on it and it's not considered you know, one of the greater blue oyster cult albums, but they really went far into the, into the poppy pert rock and rollsy mainstream sort of thing with the song, let go. That's the one that was the co-write with Ian Hunter. Um, it just sounded a little bit juvenile for blue oyster cult who were always, you know, the, the, the thoughtful conspiracy theory, uh, kind of cool. The intelligent band. rockers, right? Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And then it, the exact same thing happened again for beat them up on club ninja. It's, it's essentially let go another another time around so again it's the same sort of thing with, with you're not the one when people want to dislike this album they're going to go straight to beat them up and my fifth choice um which is also from this album make rock not war right which are the two songs on here that are you know that one's that one's a little more uh kind of on its way to perfect water but not as good as perfect water but it's still a little bit like like beat them up so those are the so those are the two songs and the title is just ridiculous make rock not war right yeah no it is um, yeah uh, so, so those have always been uh, in for some ridicule um, just in in terms of any sort of honorable mentions I guess I only had well I had going through the motions from Spectres and I had the Marshall Plan um, from uh, from Cultosaurus, which which I always, never liked that song. I, I I don't recall it being in for a lot of ridicule, but it's got the Don Kirshner cameo thing in it. It's a little, 
it, it's it's just really kind of like a pomp rock song. It doesn't fit the the cool mood of of the great songwriting on on that album. It's just a little cheesy, I suppose. So there you go. Do you remember like how much ridicule Club Ninja in general got back in the day? Oh yeah, that was like yeah. the whipping boy of the catalog for a yeah, while. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the title of the album doesn't help. I mean, it's just a terrible yeah. title. Um, you know. All these years later, though, I actually quite enjoy Club Ninja, but I wouldn't I wouldn't even listen to it back in the day. I was like, oh, yeah, was terrible. Yeah. And, you know, so Perfect Water is considered the best song on the album, but really the second best song on the album, they didn't even write. It's it's White Flags by the Legat Brothers. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's that's kind of an odd thing about it, too. And obviously it's yeah, the production's pretty gratuitously. 80s but in a like a cheap 80s way in a, in a yeah. kind of yeah it's it's not even like a big stadium rock 80s production it's right, just like exactly a, like yeah. a crappy one right yeah. yeah yeah you have to wonder if, if they had similar production on that like they had on fire of on or on or origin if the things would be a little different you know or yeah. would have been a little different when that out first came out so who knows all right how about some rush okay so we got a couple here uh first of all let's go back to caress of steel i think i'm going bald yes hard rock boogie from rush yeah yeah i don't know it, it you know it totally does not fit on that album that album is dark and heavy and menacing and metallic and then you've got this kind of like uh you know rush doing their canadian uh, status quo hard rock and boogie i don't know it just doesn't fit it's not your typical lyric from from uh, neil and yeah it's just not a not a really good song I, you know hopefully hopefully back in the day i don't know because i wasn't listening to rush when that album first came out but hopefully people didn't get turned off by that and not listen to the rest of the album but uh yeah that's no good let's go ahead to uh a song that was released as a single from this then new album that i remember myself and everybody i knew who was a rush fan were absolutely horrified by the first time we heard it on the radio new world man <laughs> yeah you remember that? You remember that time, Martin? We're totally like, rec- I totally remember the ridicule of that song. Do, 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 do. You know, <laughs> as soon as you heard that, right? Like, what is this? <laughs> Where's the guitars? Like, what, yeah. what is going on with this? I mean, you know, listening to it nowadays, I mean, you can appreciate the song for what it is. It's still, for my money, the, one of the weakest songs on that album. But man, Getty's bass line just popping all over the place. It's And, you know, to me, the, the song always sounded really rushed. And then, you know, you read up and you probably know this. You, uh, this was like the last song they added on the album. They like they had some time they had to fill on the vinyl re- for the vinyl release. And uh, they're like, all right, you guys got to put together like a little three or four minute long song. So this was just like put together really quickly. And it kind of sounds like it. Right. But it's almost it, it's just to me. It, and it's ironic that they released that as the first single. The last album, the last song that made the album that they're kind of throwing at the end becomes the single. It's almost like the paranoid story all over again. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, now, you know, all these years later, I think people appreciate New World, man. But at the time, man, holy people were like ready to jump off the rush ship in droves. What is this nonsense? And, you know, looking back. Uh, Because I was one of them. I was like, at at the time, I was like, "Mm, not fully on board with Signals. And now I absolutely love the album. But uh, yeah, back then, man, New World Man was almost like the the dynamite that blew up that whole album for, you know, like not in a good way either. So uh, that's my second choice here. Uh, Let's go a couple of years later. So if you were like kind of still on the fence with Rush, but you were like not really sure about the direction they were going in and you were pining for the old days of the 70s, once you heard Time Stand Still and The Mission from Hold Your Fire and you heard all those synthesizers and almost no guitars from Getty and all that Time Stand Still, you're like, what in the world is this? I mean, for those people that hate hated Rush in the 80s, these two songs are the absolute poster child for that period. And again, I think all these years later, most of us who are still on board with Rush uh, kind, of, kind of appreciate these for what they are. But at the time, I hate it. You know, most people made fun of the videos because they looked ridiculous right at the time. They had the real short hair and dressing all, you know, corporate and whatnot and, you know, playing the headless guitars and all that kind of nonsense, whatever. So the mission and time stand still. And last but not least, because I, again, I think I was more horrified by this than anything else I've said before. Uh, and so are a lot of people. Rapping in a Rush song, roll the bones. Blasphemy. Yeah. <laughs> Absolute blasphemy. Go, looking back though, 
Roll the Bones is actually a pretty fun song, but at the time, man, that was like absolutely taboo. What are you doing, guys? Uh, that is not a place we want to see Rush going into. So there you have it. Cool. I definitely add two to that in Rush lore. Uh, Tai Shan um, with the whole, you know, uh, oriental music thing to it and the, you know, the, the um, pretentious lyrics about, you know, the travel in China or whatever it is, right? And Dog Years. It's Dog Years or Dog Days? Dog Years, I think it's yeah, called, yeah. you know, and with the, with the silly puns in it and stuff. Both of those are, are always ridiculed by Rush fans and just, just considered ridiculous things. And, and, you know, Neil could go too far sometimes on in yeah. the lyrics and trying yeah. to be a little cutesy. Right. <laughs> and with, with wordplay and stuff like that. And then one other one that, that is in for some ridicule, and this is partly the band's fault itself is in the mood on the first one. Right. It's yeah, considered a little considered bit that. poppy and a little bit too, too um, pedestrian for like them and a little bit too rock and rollsy. Right. Yeah. So I yeah, almost yeah. went with vital signs also, because I remember at the time oh, yeah. that, all, that was like considered the one yeah. weird uh, song on moving pictures because it's got yeah. like this, you know, kind of little uh, snappy reggae type of uh, guitar riff and whatnot. Uh, but again, you know, nowadays we, we look at moving pictures as an absolute monster classic album with no weak points. And I, yeah. back in the day, hated that song. I love it now. And I think that's yeah. partly because, you know, for me, like side one of moving pictures, I don't really need to hear much anymore because that's the side we always played, right? You know, the, the, all the big hits were on there, the big concert songs. Side two is where you had the real interesting stuff on that album. So, yeah. but anyway. Cool. All right. Back to you. Okay, so I built a bit of a challenge for myself with this next one, Black Sabbath. I realize there's not a lot of ridiculed songs in the Black Sabbath catalog, so I'm going. Uh, I, I'm going. I'm leaning a little more into personal experience with with ridicule on these ones. So, um, <clears throat> Volume Four changes. Uh, we absolutely ridiculed that song to death. Did not like it. Obviously, Ozzy went and redid it with his daughter, right? Uh, later on, um, which doesn't help. But, you know, just that that little, doo -doo 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 -doo, dee -dee -dee -dee, you know, that little piano thing. Um, so we, as, you know, angry young metalheads really hated that song, really ridiculed it. Um, and it, it almost sounded like, like, you know, Sabbath was just trying to make the most annoying song they possibly could uh, anyway. So I just like that, the absolute opposite of what they normally do. So yeah, that's- But it's got Mellotron in it, so all the prog fans love it. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, exactly. I forgot about that. Yeah, it, it, it definitely does have a bit of an arrangement to it, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I guess, yeah. Um, and I certainly remember from this record, Sabotage, uh, Am I Going Insane? Yeah. being pretty ridiculed uh, by us at the time, you know, with the, with the, nah, 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 you know, that, that whole kind of sing songy childish sort of melody to it. Um, and it wasn't a heavy song. And even actually super czar on this was quite ridiculed by us as kids, you know, with the whole operatic thing going on and, oh, uh, you know, uh, so, so yeah, we, we made a lot of fun of that song as, as kids as well. Um, you know, personally, I don't remember either of those coming in for a lot of ridicule beyond our friend group like in in reviews or anything like that um another one uh we just did a contrarians patreon episode with 12 people where we talked all about pete's favorite album uh never say die and um you know i i definitely think um when they the farthest they went out on this would be air dance and breakout and breakout is all is like an instrumental kraut rock song it's a it's a big brass arrangement and stuff so i i definitely remember there being a lot of ridicule certainly for breakout on this it was like okay uh if 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 i thought if if my narrative was that they were out of ideas on all these regular sabbath songs on here i this confirms it for me they really were out of ideas uh, you know when you put something like breakout on there um oh actually uh i'm uh, i may be going a little over here um but anyways um country girl on uh on um mob rules you know, I really like it. I think it's a great song, but uh, you, we all know the story that Geezer and Tone, Tony thought Ronnie's lyric was a little twee. That was their exact words, right? It was a little fell in love with a country girl and all this kind of stuff, right? Um, and, and you know, the, the riff itself is is a fairly melodic riff to go along with the whole thing. So it, it is the one song on here that has been in for a little bit of ridicule. But other, other, than, other than that, there's no ridiculed songs really on all three of the, the Dio albums, you know, including Dehumanizer. And, and an absolutely clear choice is uh, 
the illusion of power on this one for the exact same reason of as roll the bones. It's got yep. it's got a rap part on it, right? It you know the Ice T cameo on here, which just seemed stupid, and and even the whole lyric, uh, you know, the illusion. Do I you know whatever you whatever Tony says in there, it just sounds too melodramatic, and even the riff is just like a boring Tony Doom riff. So so I remember when this came out, nobody really likes this album anyways, but the illusion of power was absolutely the flashpoint for the exact same reason as as roll the bones essentially. So there you go, Black Sabbath. Cool. Good choices there. Actually, I had a couple of, you know, slight honorable mentions. I'm all right gets in for a lot of ridicule off of technical ecstasy with Bill Ward saying oh, yeah, yeah, Beatlesque yeah. ballad. And Rock and Roll Doctor gets a little bit of ridicule as well for being a barroom kind of boogie. They're only really boogie bluesy rock and roll song of, of the later period at all. Yeah, so, Rock and Roll Doctor, the, uh, the brother to No Bone movies, right? They're almost yeah, exactly. exactly the same song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, funny. Uh all right. Well, kind of like you, my next choice is uh, this is a band where I think uh, they more get ridiculed for albums, not as much songs. So I went more on the personal level with them, I think. Uh, Uriah Heep. So, you know, critics have savaged so many of their albums over the course of their career. It almost seems like that's just the normal thing to do. Uh, but there are some songs that, uh, you know, myself and friends and whatnot have kind of poked fun at over the years. The first one, I'm going to go to the Return to Fantasy album for a song called Prima Donna. Sorry, but, you know, saxophone and R&B arrangements in a Uriah Heap song should never happen. You know, you want to you want to know the right way to use maybe horns in a Heap song. We can go back to Salisbury, the title track. That's a cool way to do it, but not on Prima Donna. Awful, awful song. I don't you know. I mean, they're, they're, we're talking about a, a time in their career where they were making some bad choices with with styles and things like that on each album. They had a couple of really questionable songs. Uh, we'll go to High and Mighty uh, for Can't Stop Singing which is a pure funky pop song. Again, what are you guys thinking? You know, I mean, some of these bands, you can give them a little bit of credit for trying to do something different, but at least make the song good and memorable. Can't Stop Singing is not memorable. It's not fun. It's just nothing. So, uh, I, I like Martin. I sometimes have a problem when, you know, bands that don't need to do cover songs do cover songs. And I'm going to go to the Head First album, when they covered Brian Adams' Lonely Nights. First of all, I mean, that was a big hit for him, like what, the year before? And now you're gonna cover it again. Like when, uh, you know, you wanna cover it 10 years after, after the fact? I get it. Uh, and the fact is, it's not even, I'm, I'm not a Brian Adams fan, but it's not even as good as his version. Uh, no good. And my last two, I'm gonna go to my least favorite. Again, this, you could basically just throw this whole album in there for me, uh, the Equator album schools burning when you can't even spell schools correctly and you spell it s-k-o-o-l-s -O -O and rock -a both songs are really bad attempt at 80s glam metal and the video for rock -a is just absolutely horrific the way they're dressed they're all sitting on the couch mick box looks like why the fuck did i do this and it's just like like they can't wait to move on to something else and it's a it's a real shame because i really like the two albums that came before it i think peter golby is a terrific singer and it was a good fit in that band and i think that that version of the band deserved lots more acclaim than they actually got but it was a way to get the band back out there into the spotlight and i i love them for it but man for me this album the production of the album is so like mid 80s lots of synthesizers and bad program drums and bad vocals and i think there's good songs on that album but not the way it actually came out and uh yeah those two songs are just absolutely ridiculous i mean we we made fun of that entire album when it first came out all of us heat fans but those two songs for me just stick out like sore thumbs not good so uh, i'll leave the rest of heap alone because uh, i think there's you know i i really wanted to see if i could find anything from the early albums and i really couldn't find anything that i remember anybody you know again critics savaged all their albums but not really picking out songs. I almost did come away Melinda yeah. because I mean, everybody's done that song. It's like, do we really need to hear that again? Yeah. But uh, I decided to stay away from the Byron era on this one. You know, the early part of it, I should say, actually. So, yeah, all I had left uh, was really, I thought you were going to say for full albums, you were going to say Conquest because I think there's a lot of Conquest. Here's the thing. He, I'm so happy you brought that up. So I, the first thing I did was I went and replayed Conquest last night because I'm like, I know, because I've never liked that album. I know there's stinkers on here. And I listened to the whole album. And I was like, wow this is not as bad as I remember it. I couldn't pick out any song that I hated. I was like, man, I hate 
equate are way more than this. And I'm like, I'm sitting there like, I think this Conquest is just an album where it just seems unfocused. Uh, you know, you got, you bring in John Sloman, who sounds just like Glenn Hughes, and it almost clashes with the songs. But, you know, Ken Hensley's writing almost everything on it. The songs really aren't that bad. It just sounds like the band is just like they hate each other and they were, they were just like phoning it in. But I, I didn't find anything like really like offensive or I don't know. I, I, I actually, after I listened to it last time, I'm like, you know, what? I may actually go play that at the gym tomorrow and just like jump back into that album and say, all right, why am I hating this album all these years? Cause it last night quickly going through, it didn't sound bad to me, but yeah, I, I, I'm glad you picked up on that. Cause I wanted to mention it, that I really wanted to pick a, a conquest song and I, I couldn't find any. Yeah. So. Yeah, you're right. The theme with heap is, is those songs from, from the sort of 74 to 79 period that are that are like funky barroom rock and rollsy with the hoo-hoos and stuff like that right <laughs> you know those are all the ones that that were in for a lot of ridicule and there's really nothing nothing to ridicule in the bernie shaw era really no at all. not at um, all and the early ones and the only one i was going to mention was come away melinda as well so yeah all right so my last one um is this band here scorpions um you know i i I found this, this was a band that I was referring to early on when, when I mentioned that you almost feel sorry for them later because there's too much to ridicule because I really have this grave feeling in my mind that, that they just lost the plot of how to write good songs eventually. Uh, and there, there's a lot. And, and even when they're doing like pretty heavy albums later on, it just doesn't seem like the songwriting magic is there. And then they feel like they have to bring in all these outside songwriters who don't do much of a better job for them either. Um, but I'm not going to really focus on that except for one of my picks. Uh, the first one I'm going to pick, and there's no songs really to ridicule in the Uli John Roth era either. I couldn't really find anything. I mean, we thought Hellcat was kind of funny when that album came out in 76, right? But my first one is um, I'm going to go with Bad Boys Running Wild from this uh, because I felt that this was their British steel, their dumbing down sort of album. We were not happy with this album when it came out. And, the, and we thought the lyrics, you know, we're even kind of getting stupider because you could even hear them better. And you're also thinking, you know, they should be getting better at it, but they're not really getting better at it. And I thought that was a pretty pedestrian song. So that's the you say yes from this album for me. There's a couple others on here as well. Like Big City Nights is, oh, is very similar to me as well uh, in that in that respect. Um, but, you know, a funny, funny thing I wanted to mention is Rock You Like a Hurricane, which is about my favorite song on here the same thrill is pretty good too the the reggae sounding one is actually pretty cool on here too yeah. i think crossfire as soon as the good times roll uh but rock you like a hurricane was in for a fair bit of ridicule again for this idea of this stupid sort of song title this this uh english as second language german of it and you know I, I was talking to david david krebs last week you know they were managing the band at the time and he said the funny thing about the scorpions lyrics is that is that because they did some of that english as a second language awkwardness of phrase they kind of stuck because like you said no english person would ever say that right <laughs> and so so i always hear people who don't know music very much you know just in passing conversation would say oh we're gonna rock you like a hurricane you know and stuff like that so it was in for some ridicule but i think it's actually the most intelligent song on the album musically speaking oh, musically, yeah, yeah. the minor and major and the stopping and the and the no drum beat and the and that weird intro i really liked it it was an advanced single from the album so that was in for some ridicule um but not from me. Um, and then uh, what is my next choice? Uh, how many have I done? Two, so three. Yeah, three. Tease Me, Please Me from Savage Amusement. Um, just that whole, the title that had you turned off, even though the song wasn't that bad, but um, that album was the difficult follow-up to this. And David Krebs has explained the whole financial thing going on at the time, why that album took so long. But so that was a problem. Wind of Change. Which with the whistling and the melodramatic and oh, it's this song with all this great meaning about the fall of the Berlin Wall and all this. But that whistling just drives me crazy. It drives a lot of people <laughs> That's crazy. That's to me right? too. <laughs> all whistling in, in songs drives people crazy. And, and, you know, musically, it's not that well put together musically. I mean, the melody is not that great. Um, and then my final one uh, is an absolute perfect choice. 
to be number one from eye to eye. That's the one with the little pop, do, 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 you know, little thing going on. And they're, they're acting like, you know, the Def Leppard XXX. Well, we're pop stars all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was pushed as a single and it's just so horrible. Uh, everybody just like was horrified when they heard that it's actually a co-write between Peter Wolf and, and Matthias Jabs, believe it or not, but yeah, it's got this ridiculous little hip hop beat going behind it. And all of a sudden, you know, Klaus is, 10 years younger and dancing away and he's like a little teen star or whatever he is right just this stupid vocal melody and rhythm to it it's just the most annoying song and and it was pushed as a single and it was hugely hugely ridiculed at the time as was the whole album um you know uh so so that that is a perfect one but yeah it was kind of hard finding them in a certain way but people kind of just generally ridicule scorpions uh and like i say later on there was just almost too much to ridicule and yeah. you kind of felt sorry for them yeah man you know i remember when love the first thing first came out you know obviously we were all still riding the high from blackout and we're like yes new scorpions album and, and i remember when i first got it I was pretty into it for a couple of months. And then I started slowly realize this is not a great album at all. And I think like nowadays, I never listen to that album or really, I have a hard time listening to anything past that album. Yeah. Like all those albums for, albums for me are just have so much weak material on them, like lyrically, musically, and just they, they're all really safe and just like trying too hard to me it sounds like i don't know i find when i want to listen to the scorpions it's all the uli stuff the first album with michael and those first couple of matthias albums i think for me blackout and back is what i really like i i don't care much for the rest of it anymore and i used to be a huge fan of all that stuff i don't know and the, and the point is about blackout it's an interesting situation where you know even if there's things on there you might not be that that into and it's a little commercial because at that point scorpions are almost cooler than they had ever been in their lives even oh, with yeah. Uli. there's a certain cool factor about blackout it's like these these german this german band with this great album cover and this amazing production so you're so you're championing the whole album you're on board with it and for that reason you're not feeling that ridiculing really has any place in this conversation with yeah, yeah yeah and, and they were the music at that point was a lot of fun it was energetic. And when you saw them live, they were amazing, right? And then all of a sudden they're trying to do all these ballads and just be the, the, the cool guys. And it's like, it just, it lost its luster for me in a big way. Yeah. All right, my last choice for today, um, might, might as well go big or go home, right? Deep Purple. So, uh, <laughs> all right, my first target of, of this, uh, of this top five stinkers list for purple ridiculed album uh, songs is uh, from the fireball album anyone's daughter yeah <laughs> you know do we really want to hear ian gillen doing his best bob dylan impersonation on this kind of like uh talky folky whatever you want to call it song it sticks out like a massive sore thumb on fireball which is a classic purple album to me i you know i generally speaking when I listen to an album, I listen to it start to finish. That's just the way I've always been, whether I, I'm popping a CD in or listening to it on an iPod or listening to it on the computer, or whatever. I listen to the whole thing through and through. I can't stand that song. I skip it every time. I never liked it. We always made fun of that back in the day. It's just, and ironically enough, it's like Gillen's favorite album. I think his favorite song on the album. Go figure. Sorry, Ian, I don't agree. Uh, next up, we're going to go to Slaves and Masters, right? Uh, everybody knows my love for this album. Um, Breakfast in Bed. Title alone says it all. Silly, rainbow light pop. No thanks. Don't like it. Uh, let's, let's go one album further. The Battle Rage is on. Lick it up. Do we really need another song title? Lick it up. Terrible lyrics plotting kind of pseudo metal arrangement it's just a bad song again we know the history of what's going on with the band during this album so it's not surprising that uh there there's there's actually a few titles that i almost chose from this album but i didn't want to pick on just one album uh let's go way back shades of deep purple again no beatles covers ever please help and it's not even close to being good man boring rod evans just crooning away stop guys I, why people are doing beatles covers like a year after the beatles did these songs themselves i'll never understand and then last but not least because we're going to stick on the covers theme we're going to go to the infinite album or infinite however one decides to stay that say that 
uh, a fantastic album. And then the last song, they decide to do a cover of The Doors, Roadhouse Blues. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First of all, that is a song that has been covered by everybody under the sun. And while the band sounds like they're having a blast doing it, I don't want to hear it. So again, when we get to that second to last song and Roadhouse Blues is coming up, stop. That's the end of my listening to that album. And of course, now we have to look forward to an entire album of covers from my favorite band of all time next month. We'll see how that turns out. So there you have it. <laughs> cool. Well, I'll, I'll add a couple to that. One cool. clear one, one clear, clear one, I think is Kentucky Woman. Yeah. <laughs> that was quite ridiculed for a long time yeah i guess i om i almost thought about throwing that in there i'm glad you brought it up i, I thought then, about it and then hush hush is a little ridiculed I think, yeah, in them yeah. as well uh but not as bad as kentucky woman and then you know as soon as you brought up battle rages on i'm thinking one man's meat uh, how does that go one man's meat is another uh, is aching butt something like that right do you know what that was on my original list i decided <laughs> to look it up was worse <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the but, only you know, reason why is because musically, I think One Man's Meat kicks ass because that album is pretty heavy. Yeah. But man, I look it up. I was like, oh, geez, look it up. Da -da -da. And even in One Man's Meat, they even do, he does like this little weird rapping thing too in that song. I'm like, what? But but it's heavy as all hell. So I was like, all right, I'll give that a pass for today. But yeah. And Lick It Up has, has you know, uh, Lick It Up. Da -da -da -da, <laughs> you know? So you're right. That one too. Actually, another one I just forgot. Razzle Dazzle. Razzle Dazzle, yeah. That came in for a lot of ridicule at the time. Yeah. If people, you know, who else remembers you know what was going on at the time when when that album came out bananas i think it is right um but but when that when that album came out um definitely everybody including myself focused on calling razzle dazzle the worst song in the album i totally remember that right is it is it bananas i'm pretty sure it is right i'm pretty sure it is yeah, yeah. um so so yeah definitely and it, it just everything about da, 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 you know that, that whole the, the the crappy riff and the and the crappy title and all that kind of yeah. thing right? so that one definitely came in came in first it's amazing time. you know you go back and look those first couple of deep purple albums there's so many covers i almost picked hey joe because it's like do really do we need to go there freaking hendrix just did this and made it a smash so now you're going to try and, and have the same luck and it's not even good i was like oh man way too many covers I, I mean i know there were a lot of bands doing that but you know what it is the vanilla fudge i think ruined it for everybody else because the vanilla fudge proved that you could do covers of like non-rock songs and, and and people would be interested and so everybody else was doing the same thing but oh god stop please help me if you can i'm feeling down <laughs> it's like oh my god what is this like the doom version of help please yeah. awful it's terrible well the only thing worse is kentucky woman <laughs> do, do. she gets to know you <laughs> <laughs> was a hit for them surprisingly yeah, but yeah. uh yeah <laughs> Ah, uh, so there you have it everybody so uh, what do we got classic bands most ridiculed songs uh part one i guess so stay tuned for more of this this was actually kind of fun again this is all meant to be in fun. We are not the first people on the planet who have made fun of these songs. So the reason why we pick them is because that seems to be the general consensus, but we fully understand there's going to be folks out there watching that love a lot of these tracks and Hey, God bless you. That's great. Cause uh, you know, we all hear things differently. So Martin, uh, what's going on over uh, in your neck of the woods? We know you got some stuff in stock to sell. What do you got uh, that's available? Yeah, just, just right in a way. Um, yeah, so at martinpopoff.com, I still have a supply of the new Nazareth uh, visual biography book and the Heap one as well. Um, I think I've got a small supply of the Van Halen one. The Blue Oyster Cult one, eh, not really. I'm down a couple on that. But yeah, the Van Halen I still have. And I think I have about five of the Thin Lizzy. So martinpopoff.com uh, for that. And otherwise, just kind of writing away on some, uh, some other projects. Cool. Sounds good. So if everybody watching, uh, expect a review of Martin's new Nazareth uh, visual biography next Wednesday on our normal What's Up with See You Tranquility Day. I'm about halfway through it. I'll definitely finish it before then. So uh, it's a good one. So if you're a Nazareth fan, you're going to want to have it. So please go over to martinpopoff.com and get yourself a copy either now or if you want to wait till I talk about it and show it off, whatever you want to do. But Martin's got them in stock. So please go and uh, give him some love and uh, order yourself up a copy. So uh, stay tuned for, uh, I guess, part two of this next week. So uh, we'll pick out five more bands each and uh, 
five more songs. So how many, Martin, you're better at math than I am. So that's how many songs we're going to talk about next week. Songs between us, yeah, so yeah. a lot of stuff. So, uh, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Stay tuned coming up on Sunday. We've got album homework assignment. Yours truly going up against Jamie Laszlo with Rick Labonte officiating the whole thing. So uh, that that should be a lot of fun. We've both been given our assignments. We're both ready to talk about them. So that's coming up on Sunday. And then, of course, Monday, the Hudson Valley Square starts off the whole week once again. And uh, stay tuned for that and a lot more from Martin Popoff, I am Pete Pardo. Have a good weekend, everybody. Take care.